My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, poet, playwright, and professor of English, David Starkey, editor of Living Blue in the Red States, a new essay collection about living in a place that votes one way and voting another yourself. I think it's probably attractive to see somebody question their own beliefs and backtrack a little bit and, and look at things from different angles, and hopefully that would inspire the same sort of... Uh, thinking in the redder reader. I think that the commentary on television is just, it's meant to, to be entertainment and therefore it's finding the most extreme positions. The middle ground doesn't make good TV. So I think that's one of the reasons why people will be represented by the most extreme from whatever they have. And they don't want to come to an agreement. They, they just want to argue. You just need to look at what we feel and believe across the totality of the spectrum and to finally go with what we mostly believe in. Every single interview from the Marketplace of Ideas is available on our online archive. Visit us at www.colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. You can download each show, or you can stream any of them in your browser. Join the International Marketplace of Ideas listening community by adding yourself to our Frapper listener map. The link is right on our front page, colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. My guest is David Starkey, poet and professor of English at Santa Barbara City College and the editor of Living Blue in the Red States. David, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Well, thanks. Glad to be here. Now, the book, Red and Blue, the, the red and blue of the title referring to whether you voted Bush or Kerry in the 2004 presidential election. How did you get the idea to bring together people in this situation where they voted blue, yet they live in a red area. Yeah, well, you know, I myself for seven years lived uh, in uh, Louisiana and then South Carolina. My parents are from uh, Texas and Louisiana, so I kind of grew up in a red household in uh, central California. And when I was living down there during the um, election, actually when Clinton was uh, elected and then re-elected, I noticed how outnumbered I often uh, felt by all the people around me. And so when um, Bush was uh, re-elected, I, I thought, I wonder what my old friends and uh, other people are thinking about right now. So I, I just wrote and asked them if they'd be interested in writing essays, and sure enough, they were. Was it a pretty wide phenomenon in terms of the people that you know? You knew just a lot of people who voted one way and lived in situations where they were surrounded by people who voted the other? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I guess most, uh, most poets like myself are probably... Uh, on the blue side of the, the spectrum. And so, you know, I just, uh, I was always looking for, um, you know, people who were like-minded, and I knew people from the associated writing programs and so forth. And I also just sort of sent off some, uh, some cold uh, emails to people to see if they might be interested. So, yeah, I tried to get a, a, a range of different ideas. Now, with the feeling that people had about being in this situation, did you find that when you got responses back, they were enthusiastically ready to tell you of their exasperation, or what kind of a range was there? Yeah, well, that's a, a really good question, because there was a, a, a huge range, um, particularly people who had grown up uh, in the South and lived there their whole lives. They were often describing themselves as purple. Um, they had certain blue values, but they couldn't help but be, as it were, colored by uh, the area in which they grew up. So I have, I have uh, one of the things that critics seem to respond to positively about this book is the fact that um, it's very well reasoned and, and people look at both sides of the question. Now, that's not to say that there aren't a um, few essays in here that are really, really angry. Um, so it does cover the whole spectrum. And you personally, you, what is your history? What are your red states? My red states? Yeah. Well, yeah, like I said, my, I, my own red states are Louisiana and South Carolina yeah, exactly. and also uh, going to visit my grandparents every summer in, in uh, southeast Texas and southwest Louisiana. What about those places shaped you to become? Are you are you purple, not purple, or whatever? What <laughs> sort of purple, red, or blue? What composition are you? What color would you call yourself? I think I'm probably a pretty blue purple. Although I I wrote uh, an article for the uh, Omaha um, newspaper not too long ago, and I grew up going uh, hunting with my father, and I talked about the fact that. I'll still go 
out and do of what's a very red activity, and yet most of my beliefs are really in contrast with them, you know, the, the stereotypical views. As far as the conditions, the qualities that make someone a red or blue or make them lean toward one side, is it entirely determined by the vote they cast in the 2004 presidential election, or is that just a proxy of a, another quality? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's what you just said is, is entirely true. A, a few of the contributors um, were kind of you know, angry about the idea of, of this red-blue divide. Uh, David Romvit, who is the poet laureate of Wyoming, describes uh, first moving to his state and going to a poetry reading that was attended by cowboy poets, by lesbian feminist poets, by uh, a woman in her 80s who believed she was the reincarnation of an Indian maiden. And he embraces all those different ways of living in the world. So, you know, I think that how red and blue in, in, in the eyes of many of the contributors is a kind of false bifurcation. So the definition of red and blue didn't always track perfectly between contributors, or they just had different ideas about the validity of red and blue? I think both those things are true, yeah. Oh, okay, I see. So out of the group of contributors you found, these are a lot, there are a lot of academics, a lot connected with poetry. Is that true for all of them? Are they all? I, I couldn't quite tell. I was reading their bios, and I was reading their pieces, and it seemed to be they were mostly academics. But <laughs> it's, it's hard to find a person in this book who's not an academic. I think that's true. And, you know, there were certain points where... Um, I thought, boy, I, I would like to, to stretch beyond this point. But as I say in the, um, uh, in the uh, introduction, we're really interested in good writing, that that was at least a primary concern as much as anyone's political beliefs. And as you know, a lot of people who are professional creative writers gravitate towards universities. So I think that explains that. But do you think, I, I suppose this is going to be a matter of, of conjecture, but do you think that people who adopt creative writing as a vocation or as an avocation and end up in a, use, in a university environment, do they bring blueness with them, or does being in that environment make these creative writers more blue? I think they, I think they bring blue with them, and I think that that does tend to, to... Blue feeds on itself in that regard. Just as red feeds on itself in, in areas uh, in endeavors where... Most of the people are, uh, involved are conservative. At least one of these contributors mentions the effect of being in, usually it's a university campus, but being in an island of blue and surrounded by red. Right. It, what, what does that effect bring to their worldview? This, the, the island of, they have their immediate surroundings supporting their blueness, and that you go a layer out and it's red. Yeah, and I think, I think you're referring to Sidney Burris, who teaches at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. Yeah. Um, you know, it... it there is a little bit of a siege mentality, I think, that comes with that. I, I taught um, at Francis Marion University in Florence, South Carolina, which is one of the most conservative parts of the country. And even within our little uh, campus, there were plenty of uh, professors who were, who were red. But in the English department itself, it was a pretty blue environment. I think you often felt like um, you weren't sure if you could say what you were really thinking without getting a lot of grief for it. There's that, that kind of environment effect that you can tell at work in a lot of these pieces. Now, I wanted to go back a little bit to the 2004 election itself. How much did that specific election, how much did that motivate you to do this project? Was it just that, or is it more of a well, that, life that was thing? Well, that was the trigger. Um, you know, uh, can I read a paragraph for you? Oh, go for it. Yeah, I, I, let me just read the, the first, uh, first little bit of the book. Uh, on the evening of the 2004 presidential election, I sat at the computer in my Santa Barbara home and willed the voters in the Cleveland area precincts to carry Ohio into the blue Democratic column. I poured all my mental energy into it. If Ohio went for John Kerry, there might be just enough electoral college votes to tip the balance in his favor. But if Ohio voted Republican red, it was all over. Bush would be reelected this time with a majority of both the popular and the electoral college vote. I sat there for hours, like someone praying for the safe return of a ship he inwardly knows has already foundered. But each time new counts came in, they were no help. Terry needed a sharp upturn in the number of Democratic votes, but that didn't happen. Most of the Ohio precincts were favoring the Republican candidate. Even the battleground city of Columbus was drifting right. Finally, I went to bed full of despair. And I think that was a really common experience for 
people who were Democrats, um, you know, there was that headline um, in, I think it was the London Weekly Standard that said, how can 59,473,000 people be so dumb? <laughs> um, you know, that there was a, just a sense of disbelief. What did you want to avoid in compiling these pieces together? Because now you've just read that headline, and were you afraid that there might be any sort of sneering quality to the pieces that you collected? Oh, sure, yeah. And, you know, I did, I did warn people about that. That was the, when I solicited essays from folks, I, I said, let's try and avoid that. Let's, you know, let's think about both sides. Let's, if we decide to make a case very strongly, let's make it using reason. And, and I think that people generally held up to that. They kept both perspectives in, in their view screens, you might say. And, I forget if it was you in the book that commented on this or someone else, but that, that tended to result in essays that didn't take a hard line. They were of a different form. That's right, yeah. And, and so it's interesting. You know, I've had a, a couple of reviews from people who were, are a little bit on the, the conservative side, and, and they've been praising it. I haven't had the book embraced as much by, say, like, move on, uh, as, I, <laughs> as I might have initially thought. And now, you say move on, and I, I think back to the piece about the move-on volunteers right. and what a dismal experience they had. What region were they in, by the way? That was an essay written by a woman who teaches at the University of Kansas, and she's going through Independence, uh, Missouri, right. trying to get people to vote as a member of Move On, and she just has a horrible uh, experience. And, you know, I think that's, to me, that's a real strength of this book, is that she's very left-wing, um, she's an avant-garde fiction writer, and she's talking about this organization that she supports just in really kind of uh, unflattering detail. <laughs> and, and so I, th I think that's a kind of blue perspective, I would say, that the willingness to say, look, this is, this is where we go wrong, too. And so it's a willingness to look at the faults of the blue as well as the red, and is that, as you were saying, the reason that organizations like Move On haven't commented too much on the book? <laughs> It may well be, yeah. But it's it's not as uh, you know dogmatic as it as it as it might be. <laughs> and you have words at the end about this particular subspecies of the personal political essay. And what makes these personal political essays different than others? Well, you know, I as I was looking around, I realized that that's a relatively rare uh, type of essay. Most essays involved with politics are meant to try and persuade you to do something. That, Rhetoric is kind of at the forefront. And here, meditation and, and introspection are, are part of it. So I think that kind of that, that's a, a sort of new mixture. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm really proud to have a book here that, that showcases that word. You would say these are not essays that argue a specific point. They don't say, I'm going to argue this, and then they argue it. A lot of them are more exploratory, maybe? Absolutely. And, and they double back. They undercut their own thesis. And you know, I, I talk in there about even if there is such a thing as a thesis, most people said I started with an image, an idea, a feeling, and I went from there. And I think that's very different from the typical essay about politics. What surprised you about the contributions you received? Well, you know, I was just really pleased um, that so many essays came out that I thought so well. I was um, fascinated by the essay by my friend uh, Bona Lisa Saloy, uh, who was writing about fleeing Katrina and talking about Hurricane Betsy. Um, I, I do love the essay by David Case uh, playing Debussy in the heart of Dixie, where he just really um, uh, goes after Alabama. And so I, I like the idea that you can get really angry um, and, and that some of the people did do that. And as far as searching for a press to publish this book, what was that process like? What did you take into consideration? Well, you know, I, I mentioned the introduction that I didn't want to have it as a kind of piling on thing. So I looked for uh, university presses in red states. And the uh, University of Nebraska Press happens to be right now one of the outstanding university presses. It's also in a state where not a single county voted for Kerry. Um, and so it's a very, very red state. And I was thinking that that's the, you know, that my, my audience in a way is people who are right now living blue and red. Now you mentioned Kerry, and he comes up for obvious reasons in a few of these essays. And I, I wanted to ask, as, as someone who <laughs> tends to dislike all presidential candidates, I guess you might call me, <laughs> uh, who is John Kerry to these, these people in your book, to the, your contributors? Is he, is he just a figurehead for Democrats 
the, having the chance to take Bush's place, or is he more than that? Is he a person people supported? I'm, I never yeah, that, was that's, that I think clear. that's a good question. I don't think, you know, I, don't, I couldn't speak for the uh, contributors in their private lives, but as far as they express themselves in these essays, I think that he is largely, yeah, just a representation of not Bush. <laughs> Which is exactly what he was repeatedly accused of, not, right. not having much substance beyond not Bush, I see. So it's, they, they, believe, they accept that, but it still doesn't matter because it, it would be not Bush yeah. to them. Now, the regions you cover in the book, there's, uh, there's West, there's Midwest, and there's the South, and it slants heavily toward the South. I think that half the book, or maybe more, is the South yeah. from when I was reading it. Was that just a function of where the people you knew were located or who had the most complaints, you might say, about their, their red region? Or was that deliberate, I want to have more from the South than I think areas? it was a combination of, of all the things that you just mentioned. I, I'm from the South. Or my parents are from the South. I lived in the South. A lot of people I knew were in the South. I also think that the, the South is the region that, that drives a lot of conservative uh, politics in the country. That's where the president's from. That's where Bill Clinton was from. Mike Huckabee is looking uh, pretty strong all of a sudden. <laughs> um, you know, I think that that's, and that's a, a, big, a big chunk of the population. The Midwest, you know, the Midwest was, um, was red, but the Midwest has been blue in the past. So I think that sort of waxes and wanes a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the, the Mountain West, I found two great essays uh, from Alaska. So, you know, our smallest state is, is sort of overrepresented, but I think the, the essays are really good. Do you get an idea of the the hardest place, the hardest red place for a blue person to be? Yeah, I I do think it's in the uh, the Christian South. I think that's that's the place where people are most kind of in your face about what do you believe and do you believe what I believe. That was my experience, and I think that's a lot of experience of the conservatives. One of the most interesting things about having so many academics is that a lot of them give perspectives on students that they've taught and how they vary from place to place and what has your experience been as, as someone who's done plenty of teaching with students in red and blue areas how do they yeah how do well, they that's, diverge? that's a good question um it seems as though you know the contributors find their students um, to be less politically active in general than, than they were you know earlier in their own lives and i found when i was living in, in south carolina that my students were very conservative and very vocal about it. Um, as I've come back to California um, you know, uh, for the last seven years, I guess I don't hear my students talking very much about politics at all. Do you think that there's just more of a blue environment here in Santa Barbara then, or is it, is it that students have become more apathetic to politics? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know, and, and that's obviously just my own sort of little sliver of experience. I know that we have a lot of politically active students are probably listening to this program right now, so I don't, I don't want to generalize. Um, but my own experience, at least teaching creative writing at Santa Barbara City College, has been that that's not uh, an issue that people write about very often. As far as having the, the red students and the, and the blue faculty be an issue for many of the contributors, is, is that faculty-student conflict something that's something that is a major issue in, in red areas. I haven't spent too much time in them. It's, it seems like it might be it might be an issue where the faculty is much bluer than the students themselves. You know, I think you hear stories about students complaining about their professors and, and vice versa. I guess my experience, um, and I think the experience of a lot of the people that I know, is that there is a little bit of reaching out on either side in the classroom itself. So, um, if you're a student, you, your professor is going to be grading you, so you may give an extra listen to something that you otherwise might not believe in. And <laughs> obviously, if you've got um, 30 people sitting in your classroom who have a different belief, I don't think you can just monologue. You're trying to engage students. So I think it's a good place for that sort of coming together to occur. And speaking of, I wanted to ask you this. who, What sort of reader is the collection targeted toward? Who, who is the... Living blue in the red states, reader in your mind. Well, I think I think it's probably both people. I you know initially thought it was it was mostly a blue audience. I think now that that people who are conservative um, are finding things that they can read and understand. I had a um, an email the other day from uh, my friend Andrew Claven, who is a uh, detective novelist who lives in town and is conservative, and 
he was, uh, you know, reaching out, and, and I thought, well, that's a, that's a good sign. I'd like to have him as a reader. For those just tuning in, my guest is David Starkey, poet, playwright, and professor of English at Santa Barbara City College, editor of Living Blue in the Red States, a new essay collection about voting one way and living in a place that votes another. And you also mentioned earlier that you've gotten some positive press from conservatives. What about the book brings that forth? What about the book makes it not offensive to the yeah, Red States? You know, I, like I said, I think it's mostly just the fact that, that people are willing to sort of slow down and state their positions. I think it's probably attractive to see somebody question their own beliefs and, and backtrack a little bit and, and look at things from different angles. And hopefully that would inspire the same sort of uh, thinking in, in a, you know, a redder reader. Is that a response to what you may or may not have seen in mainstream blue commentary? I think that, that the commentary, in, and again, Sidney Burris talks a lot about this in his essay, on television is just, it's meant to, to be entertainment and therefore it's finding the most extreme positions. The middle ground doesn't make good TV. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why people will, have, will be represented by the most extreme from whatever they have. And they don't want to come to an agreement. They, they just want to argue. One of the things from Sidney Burris, one of the, my favorite lines from his piece, is that he describes living bloom in a red state as being a certain hell now again, but it's largely an abstract hell. And what does he mean by that? Yeah, well, that's interesting because, you know, he, um, he quotes uh, Orwell's essay on, on politics and political speech, and, and he um, feels this sense that, and I, I think people do register this throughout the book, that we have this big kind of circus once every four years, and then things drop back to normal. And, you know, he's getting the sense that I'm watching this on TV, but how does it really connect with me? That's something that uh, John Lane in his essay called Faith talks about, where he's remembering the, um, the death of his, uh, his great aunt and his mother, who were both conservative, and just that feeling of being both apart, but also wanting to reach beyond the sort of, you know, the politics of the moment. The effect of living on the, in, a, in a blue zone of a red state, some contributors, at least one, have said that it's not, it's not all bad. There's some appeal in being the misunderstood minority. How true do you think that is? Well, I think that's probably a, an appeal, uh, you know, um, wherever you live, to, to be the person who everyone else is saying, you're crazy, but you somehow know that, that, you, that you're in the right. So I think that is probably uh, slightly attractive. And it's something that's lost if you go to a, a, a bluer area. Have you, have you found that? Yeah, absolutely. Although, you know, it's interesting. I, I think Santa Barbara is a relatively blue place, but I will often hear people uh, who are blue complaining that it's a lot redder than, um, than we admit, partly because of economics. It's sort of a stealth red, you might call it. <laughs> That's a good phrase. Well, at least as you describe it, uh, it is bluer than the places to the north and south, so you, if you are a, a blue voter, you're a little more at home. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's interesting, we, we break... Uh, uh, the country up into states for the Electoral College, but if you look by precinct or county, uh, you know, uh, California itself is very red in the, the center. My hometown of Sacramento um, is, is red. Uh, the county to uh, the north of us, San Luis Obispo, and to the south, I think, both voted for Bush. We have red and blue states, and there's red and blue counties that you look at in the book as well. How, how small a unit of measurement can you go to before that kind of breaks down? I mean, you've <laughs> you talked probably about go red... right into to people's bedrooms, you know. <laughs> you talked about the the red and the blue people that exist. Is and that is it mostly that they're are they mostly shades of purple? Is what I want to get at. Yeah, I think I think that's probably true. I, I, to go back to the, that uh, editorial I wrote for the Nebraska uh, paper, I, my argument was essentially that you just need to look at what we feel and believe across the totality of the spectrum. And to finally go with what we mostly believe in, I mostly believe in, in uh, positions that are supported by Democrats, so therefore I think it makes sense that, that I would vote that way. Um, if I didn't, I, then I think I should probably switch over. And, and I, I think that's just part of that the introspective process that these writers go through is something that we can all benefit from.
Is this an optimistic collection or a pessimistic collection, or where on that spectrum is it? Yeah. Hmm. You know, I think it varies from, from essay to essay. Uh, in general, I guess I would say it's, it's slightly more optimistic. But there are certainly moments where you can feel people in the book just kind of shrugging their shoulders and sighing and wonder if things are ever going to The optimism that you do find in the collection, is it, is it optimism that maybe the country's politics as a whole will become more like my own? Or is it optimism in that, well, maybe it's it's not so bad and maybe things are, are better than I give them credit for, even with the given blue and red breakdown? I think it's actually more that the people that who are my friends and that I love and admire may be different from me politically, but there's still a lot about them that I connect with and value and cherish. And so it, it's looking beyond that broad spectrum and, and bringing it back down into a kind of a and that's what I thought the book had to say about the limited nature of one's political opinions. How much do political opinions really matter when it comes down to day-to-day -day life? Well, I, I guess at that, for, for that, I, I feel pretty strongly that they do matter. I mean, oh, I, okay. I, I fear that um, uh, Roe versus Wade may be overturned if there's another uh, Republican president, and I strongly believe in a woman's right to use an abortion if she wants to. I am a real big proponent of gay marriage, and I, I think that that's hugely influenced by, um, by politics. So you're of the mind that once political views, they, they will make a strong difference in the way that they live. I think in so. Every day. In, in, those, in those areas, I think they really do. So it's, it's certain, just the, the issues of the day, you would call them? Absolutely. And that's not just in terms of having political debates, it's the way that it's the way that you will approach the world, your, your own worldview. Yeah, and, and also what you're allowed to do and, and what you're, you're forbidden from doing. That's not a view that's shared by every contributor, was the feeling that I got. Some put more weight on politics and some put less. Absolutely. Yeah. One, I believe, I, I forget which contributor it was, the, the name slips on mind, but you'll be able to tell me, I'm sure, is the one who talked about his Facebook exercise. And what was that all about? Yeah, and again, that's our friend Sidney Burris at oh, Arkansas. It's him as well. He yeah. did a, oh, that was a, must have been a long piece or something, or just a detailed one. <laughs> it's a very long essay, a very good essay, but I think it's probably about 40, 45 pages in manuscript. Um, yeah, he, he was looking at his students, and basically he came to the conclusion by looking at Facebook and joining Facebook that people frequently form their political values based on their friends rather than the other way around, at least this generation of students. So when he was growing up in the 70s, if you were uh, conservative, you looked for conservative people. If you were liberal, you looked for other liberals. Now he thinks you look for people that you like, who have similar interests, and then your own political beliefs evolve from there. So to his mind, the, the situation has reversed where it was once you looked for the people who agreed with you. Now you look for people and you just agree with them. <laughs> yeah, you look for people you like and, and then you tend to sort of uh, think like they do. It's hard to say which way is healthier. I really couldn't come down on a side there. Well, we're in the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> People can decide for themselves. Yeah, I, I guess that is good. Now, is that the experience that you personally had in your own political development? Did you find you were, that you did the old style way or the new style way of friends and politics? You know, I guess I, I grew up in a working class environment in, in Sacramento. My parents were both public school teachers. They were um, pretty conservative, um, but I, I think my political views developed by reading uh, more than anything else. And you do mention that in, in the book, but you mention reading classics. Now, did, did the classics help develop your politics, or was it other stuff you were reading? That... I don't know. I mean, I, I think the, 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 you know, the sort of stuff that I was reading would make you think about where do I fit in the world, what's fair, what's unfair. I, I must have read a lot of uh, books where people who worked for a living weren't being rewarded in the way that they should have been, and I could look around my own little neighborhood and, and see that people worked pretty damn hard and, and didn't have a lot to show for it. What you might call the, the literature of injustice? is what Something you like that, yeah. This may be only speculation, but if reading is something that made you more blue, what do you think are the sorts of influences that make someone more red? Well, I think, uh, particularly in the South, uh, the church has a big influence on that, um, and, and, and church culture, uh, maybe that's a better way of phrasing it. 
Um, you know, there are lots of points in the Bible that you'd have to say, wow, Jesus is so blue, I can't get over it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that, that conservative Christians in the South have a really big influence on people from the time they're born until the time they die. It's a red organization based on a blue book, you're saying? <laughs> That's a catchy phrase. Yeah, I, I noticed that that was a theme that popped up at least once or twice. They saying this is a, you read the Bible and there's there's a whole lot of blue in here, yeah. but the organization that's using that as their uh, touchstone, it's a little more red. Now, I wanted to ask about politics and religion here, two, two heady subjects, but how much of red voting in your mind as a blue voter is motivated purely by religion and church membership? I, I mean, I maybe I'm, you know, swayed by watching media reports, but it seems to me that that's a, a, a huge factor that um, a lot of people will, will vote based on whether or not someone is you know, for or against abortion, that, that that's a very big thing, or gay marriage. Um, it's religiously charged issues, then, you think, are the ones that are the most important to people? They really seem to bring people out to the polls. That little layer of people that put, put um, George Bush into office were out there because they felt really strongly about certain issues. And you mentioned a few, or well, you and contributors, I guess, but you especially, I remember talking about in the book, some of the funny stuff that happened around the time of the 2004 election, like that little map that has Canada and the coasts written down as the United States of Canada, and then Jesus land all below it. Yeah. And uh, I remember an, an article in The Onion about America's poor winning an election for America's rich, and a whole lot of goofs like that. But how much of all that do you think is, is true, and how much is just kind of... We, we want to have a laugh because yeah, we're sad. Yeah, you know, I think there's a certain thing. It, 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 uh, not too many months after the election, I wrote a play, um, which has been produced at a few places, called Jesus Land, and it just <laughs> took that as, as fact. It was that, that the red states had formed a place called Jesus Land, and I had these few people sort of trying to cross the border and go back and forth. That, that kind of caught my imagination, because I like uh, alternate reality stories. But that, that's probably mostly what it is. Uh, you know... Even in Canada, Alberta, for instance, is a very conservative province. So you, you can't just map that out. Um, and we, as you were saying earlier, how far down we can go, we can go right into the house. Now that play, Jesus Land, now that you mention it, I kind of want to know a little bit more about it. Uh, was that entirely as a, as a result of that little graphic that planted the seed in your mind to you write know, Jesus yeah, Land, that, the play? That, I really found that to be a kind of a, a, a great jumping off point. And so in the play that literally Jesus Land is formed with the, the lower states there, and um, it's, it's the United States of Canada above it? You know, I called it the United Provinces of Canada. Because oh, I see. I, I thought that was a kind of a, a Marrow-centric way of looking at things. With this arrangement, are the, is the life in the United Provinces and Jesus Land different than it is in the territories that would be them? And, you know, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a little bit more totalitarian in each place. And in fact, I have... Uh, people from blue going to red and, and vice versa. And there's a sense on the part of the conservative person who's in New York that it's way too blue for him. <laughs> and the woman who's come to Beaumont, Texas, my grandparents' home, that there's no way she's going to be able to last this out for more than a few days. Do you think it would be worse or better to you if you had the choice to live in the Canada and the coasts or the, the south? Because I guess I can tell which one you would live in. Yeah. You'd live in the northern half. Would that be ultimately better, do you think, for you? Or? If, would it be better for me to live? Oh, yeah, I think, I think it would, yeah. I, I, I guess I'd take that in a second if you were <laughs> that as a choice. A lot of people seem to share that sentiment, especially immediately after the election. Yeah. With so many people contributing to the book who are connected with poetry, what do you think that brought to these essays? Just the fact that it's a little unusual, I would say, to have so many contributors who are close to poetry. What yeah, does that bring to their writing? An interesting thing. You know, I, I have so many friends who are poets. I think it, it brought a real attention to detail and to imagery and to the sound of, of language, the way that sentences are put together. So whatever that effect that has on, on the kind of political slant, it, it really, I think, improved the quality of the writing. And certainly it makes it different than most of it most of political writing that's out there, because t they tends not to be too poetry influenced, as far as I can tell. <laughs> and, and I think it, it's, you know, it's, it's journalism. It's written for the day, um, and it, it's meant to be read in a day and, and, and put aside. But I told my contributors, I'd like your essays to be 
almost as pertinent 50 years from now as they are on the day that you turn them into me. And and I think that people did try and write that way, where they were they were thinking, I'm I'm talking about something important right now, but I want to talk about it in a way that will be memorable no matter what the political. Did that creation of pertinence, of lasting pertinence, involve more talking about issues in a certain way, or more not talking so much about specific issues of the current, of the present, and widening out the analysis to you know one's own life or just political philosophy in general? Was it which one of those was it? Do you think? Well, the second one, absolutely. It, I it, see. It, there's definitely a, a more focus on on political experience and. As you said, looking at, at things from a, from a larger, more general perspective. And the book is also of the genre of creative nonfiction. Now, in your mind, how do you define the creative nonfiction genre? Well, I think creative nonfiction casts a pretty wide net, and and I think that the you know the the pieces in this are all over the place. There, there's one I don't know if you recall by uh, Michael J. Rosen, who lives in Ohio. And he is the editor of a number of humor anthologies. And, you know, he's got all sorts of different cracks about, um, you can tell a red state because there are a lot more feral hogs in it than there are in blue. Oh, yeah, I remember. yeah, I remember that. The, the sort of demographics humor piece. Yeah, yeah. This sort of blue state, red state phenomenon, living blue in a red state issue, is, is this sort of thing unique to United States politics, or is this something that goes on everywhere, where it's a... People living in places that are chunks of politics different than theirs. That's a great question. You know, and I, I really don't know that I could answer that with any kind of authority. It would be something really interesting to explore. Uh, the fact that we live in a democracy and we have quite a few rights wherever we sit on the political spectrum, I think, allows us to sort of do this and at least more openly. So, if you are uh, you know, really liberal and Communist China, uh, from a, a democratic standpoint, you might not be putting out a book called yeah. <laughs> <laughs> "Living Whatever." Yeah, yeah. Even in places with press freedom, there's there's different variations on democracy, and it got me wondering whether or not, say, a place that has proportional representation versus you know first past the post, as we have, whether they have that same feeling, or people in smaller countries. What what do you think the size of the United States has had to do with this? Oh, yeah, state, blue that's, state effect. that's really a, an excellent point. I think that it makes a huge difference, the fact that we're such a diverse people. We live all over the place. Uh, you know, you get a sense, I think, well, one of the, the reasons I, I wanted to chunk the living blue and the red states into three different uh, geographical regions was because I thought you get a feeling of these different places. Um, the, the people from the West, for instance, the landscape is such a, a big part of what they're writing about. Um, and I think, you know, it's not just who we live around, but the, the, the physical uh, nature of the place, too. I have a bunch of friends who keep insisting that the U.S. is too large to uh, to be a, a functioning country in their minds. And I think what they're saying is that the U.S. is too large to actively put forth their very own political agenda. That's <laughs> what I find. And it, it does seem to be a side effect of a country the size, even 300 million people that the United States is, that they tend to compromise and... It, it leaves a lot of people sort of mad. Is that, is that some of the anger you see in your collection, that yeah, there's I, a lot of compromise? I think so. I, you know, I, I guess ultimately I'm an optimist. I, I love this country for, its, despite its many faults, and, you know, I, you could just go on and on listing them, but I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think that there's also so many great things. I mean, as I, as I talk to you on this phone, I'm looking out my window, I can see Anna Kappa Island in the distance, I see the San Inez Mountains behind me. Uh, you know, I feel really, really uh, lucky to be here. David Starkey, thank you so much for coming on the Marketplace of Ideas. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. He also goes under the names Ice Ben and DJ Concept. Check out his website, www.benalthouse, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E, dot com. Find our complete show archive, our Frapper map, and more on our website, www.colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace.